Hello, campers. <laughs> Good to see you, Shimera. Really kick ass and chew bubblegum and he's all out of ass. Nice. That's an intro. Take notes, everyone. Right. How you doing? Is the audio and video coming through okay? Let's see who's hanging around chat today. So, Sub Darius, Jace, Elevator Simulator, Phil Fogg, for the time you're in here, which is really cool. Razadaz Root Beer, great name. Barad, hello, sir. You're surprisingly quiet for you. Um, Sebat and Bots. And this bit's working. Cool. AV okay? Hey, Barad. Awesome. Right. So, yeah, this time. Another thing that's been on the list for ages. Right, I should put links in the chat. I've got to remember to do this. We're going to do a little bit of shadow mapping. And we're going to try and keep it simple. Like, we're going to do the basics. It doesn't matter if it looks a bit ugly. But I just want to get some shadows working. Because I haven't done this stuff before. But this tutorial is really cool. As usual, it's from learnopengl.com. Let me grab the, the full link and I'll send it your way. Yeah, I thought I had it open. Preparation is the key, and then undo your preparation. Um, then, there we go, shadow mapping. Boop. By the time I've got this done, someone else has done it for me. There we are. Nice. <laughs> Seven the bots for a new band. Yes. Code their synth. Right. Um, and back on the right machine. Oh yeah, where's the doodling device? Is that working? Yep, that's cool. Groovy. Okay, so... Um, for those of you who might not have been here, along here before, there's probably one or two of you, um, we're starting out, well first off, hi. We're going to be doing some uh, Lisp GPU type coding. There is a project um, on my um, GitHub called Play With Verts, and it's where we've been doing each episode of this. And by now we've got a small base project that you can see over on the right there, um, that we start from each week. It just saves us a bit of time getting through the boring stuff. Um, but our focus, <laughs> Sergeant Queef, good to see you. Let's stand to attention, but I'm busy now. Yes, this week we're going to be doing shadow mapping, and it's a really cool little technique for doing real-time shadows. And, I mean, you can check out the tutorial itself, but the basic idea is we say, um, we have a scene with some 3D objects in it. And then we imagine that we're looking from the light's point of view. Because if, if you're looking from where a light is, you'll never see any shadows. Because you'll see everything the light reaches. And so really that's a map telling you where, where all the light goes. So if you save the depth information from that view, that tells you the distance to where the light hits. And then when you render your scenes, you do that once, capture from the light's point of view, and then you render your scene normally, and for every point, you see if you're further away than that captured depth information. And if you are, you must be in shadow. That's the general idea. And it, it makes it really nice. It should be something we can visualize as we're going, which would be cool. Um, and so, yeah, if you want to read, I will, I will spare you me reading through this, but this is the general idea. Yeah, we're gonna render from this position and store all this kind of depth information. And then when we draw this, We'll look up in this map and go, oh, we're further away than this point. We must be in shadow. So let's just go to code. Oh, Sergeant Creep saying, I started making a 2D game in Lisp, actually, with STL. Awesome. Um, unfortunately, I've missed every episode since then. Um, watch the... Uh, cool. Yeah, nice, man. Yeah, nice to have you here. Oh, why is Twitch being weird with the chat for a second? It's okay. Scrolling issues, apparently. So, okay, let's get started. The first thing we're going to need are some objects that are going to cast some shadows. So, let's go to things. We'll just take this definition of an object we've already got, which is a, ki a kind of thing. And we're going to rename it to box. We give them a default size. Um, let's just say they are two by two by two by default. And we will allow people when they make a box to pass in an optional position. So I'll do, let's say the default position is zero, five, zero. Um, nah, do it zero, zero, zero. We'll go from there. And when we make the box, 
we will, so box is this, set off the position of the box to be whatever the position that was passed in was, whoops, that one, and then we push the box onto the list of things that we're drawing, and then we're going to return the box itself. So that's fine, and the update method currently is nil, and it's freaking out. Oh yeah, because I haven't compiled this class yet. Um, and that's it. Okay, so now if we do make box and pass in 0, 5, 0, we have a box there. Let's fly on down and have a look. Currently same color as everything else, but I don't care unless one of you wants to send me some texture that is free for me to use. I'm just going to carry on using this garbage one. Or lovely one. Made by some wonderful, generous person. Um, let's make a couple more. So at two, three, one. There's another one. Um, let's one, make one at 11, one, minus two, eight, two, minus three. Okay, so we've got a few objects. And now I need a position to have our light from. So if I go over here, because we want some shadows to fall on other objects. So this would be a nice position. Do something like this. Okay. So the first thing we're going to need is a second camera. Now, luckily, from previous weeks, if I wasn't just hitting all the wrong keys right now, um, we have two cameras already created. The first one, which we're currently using, um, is a perspective camera, but we also have camera one, which is an orthographic camera. So let's set f. Um, how should we do this? Yeah, let's grab that. Grab its position. Let's set its position to be the position of the current camera, and we're going to set its rotation to be the same. So it's going to be exactly where we are right now, looking in this direction. Um, and then I'm going to move this to a different position. We can view the scene from over here. Nice, that'll do. And hopefully, if we set up the current camera to be camera one. Yes, so this is our orthographic camera. Everything's looking a little far away, but uh, distance doesn't make any difference to size in orthographic. So that's going to do. That's, what, that's where we're going to start. And it's at the position and... Um, Rotation apparently is we were a minute ago. Let's set current camera back to this one because it's nicer to work with. And we will get on to the next step once I have stared at you lovely people in chat and caffeinated myself because I'm not jittery enough yet. Levitate all the boxing, indeed. Indeed. So you can't have glue, uh, global illumination and shadow maps. There. Well, I, th I think what we'd end up doing is you end up combining a lot of techniques. I mean, there's no one golden thing that's going to save you because um, just performance reasons alone. So what I've seen norm like or quite often at least is that they have a shadow mapping approach similar to this, but they do it at lots of different resolutions. We'll talk more about that later. Um, and it's called cascading shadow maps, or at least it was a technique that was used a while ago. I don't know what the current thing is. And then you'll have a lot of baked shadows in the kind of terrain and objects already. And then you'll have, yeah, it's always smoke and mirrors. There's always like five things going on when you think there'll be one. Um, it's part of what makes all this stuff complicated. But What's nice with this technique, at least, is it's so visual. I mean, it's so easy to understand, like, how it would work. Saying that, I've got to make it work, so maybe I should shut my face and I can, then at least if I fail, I can say at the end, oh, it's terribly hard. Okay, right, so back on this computer. We are going to need to render that scene from the other um, from the other camera. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna render into a um, an FBO. So we're gonna need one of those. So let's just go to the render file for a second. This is where we've got some of our shaders and we're gonna just make a few global variables because we all love global variables. Right, um, what are we going to have? We'll have a shadow FBO. Well, really, this is a light FBO, isn't it? This is where the light is falling. Set that at nil. Um, and then we're going to make an FBO. And we don't actually need to capture any...
color information or anything like that at all. The only thing we're interested in is depth. So we're going to make an FBO with one attachment. So let's make a list where it starts with D, which is saying we're making a depth attachment. Um, and then we can give the normal arguments we give to any uh, GPU array. So in this case, we're just going to pro provide dimensions, uh, which is going to be 1024 by 1024. Completely overkill for this, actually, given the tiny resolution I'm operating at for the stream, but whatever. So that gives us an FBO with a depth attribute, which is cool. So let's set F light FBO to that. In fact, while I remember, I'm going to add this to the reset function just in case I screw everything up again this week and have to end up restarting. Um, unless light FBO set F light FBO to that. Cool. Um, what next? Okay, so we're going to need to, once we've captured this, we're going to need to read the data out of the FBO. So our FBO contains attachments. So let's look at those first. Let's look at attachment of, um, it's not shadow FBO, it's light FBO. I should have gone with my gut reaction on the naming because this is going to trip me up for the rest of the stream. We look at the depth attachment, which is a GPU array, which is backed by a texture. It's got this um, pixel for, well, internal format, I think is the GL term for that, um, which is just some sensible default for depth. And it's got the dimensions we specified, which is cool. We can also get the texture that is, um, that contains that GPU array. So we can do that in two ways. You can either get the, you can call attachment texture. Oh no, sorry. You can call GPU array, is it GPU array texture? Yeah, it should be. On the GPU array you got back from this. And that will give you that. But you end up writing this so often, I just gave a shortcut called attachment text. So that is what we want. So what we're going to do with that, once we have it, is sample it. And this is going to give us a sampler that we can then read from in our shaders. So let's go up here, make a def file, and it's the light sampler. Still not sure about that naming. Set f light sampler to be that last thing. So that sampler is now in there. You can check that quickly to make sure I'm not mad. Cool. And once again, for sanity reasons, we will go and do this. Um, set f light sampler to be the sampled texture in that FBO. Groovy. And on we go. Right, so now, right, what do we want to do? Well, there's a couple of things. The first is because when we're rendering from, from here, we don't need any color information and only depth, there's no point in having our fragment shader do a bunch of work that it doesn't need to. And this is, I mean, this is a kind of a premature optimization. It won't make any difference for our stream, but it is what's in the instructions um, in the linked article. So we're going to do it as well. So what I'm going to do is make a, um, yeah, an alternate fragment stage. I don't know why I copied it because I'm going to be deleting almost all of it. In fact, I will delete, yeah, pretty much everything. Now, even though we're not going to be using these, I'm going to keep the signature the same because it means we can reuse the uh, vertex shader for now. And yeah, I want to do that. So, oh yeah. Shouldn't have called it the same name. So let's bring that back by recompiling the original fragment stage. And this is going to be called the light fragment stage. Um, is this a good name? Oh, let's just, it's, it's light now. It's light everywhere. Stop worrying about the name. Okay, so which makes this the light pipeline. And means we're doing the light frag stage. Okay, so that is now compiled. Um, and we want to render using it. So let's go back to our primary file. And this is where we're rendering everything here. So first thing I'm gonna do actually is I'm just gonna move this out to its own function. Um, seeing as it's about rendering all the things, we'll call it render all the things up here. Defun 
grand are all the things. And we're going to need some arguments, and we'll let our errors tell us what they are. So we need delta. Um, and nothing else, really? I think we're going to want to be able to pass in the pipeline ourselves. So pipeline. And let's pass in the camera as well. Yeah. That seems sensible. So now we're going to need those two. Pipeline, camera, and delta. Okay, so now we go down here. And instead of... So if we compile this right now, everything disappears, of course. And we say render all the things. We're going to get it back to where it was. Ah, I'm not getting hints. Right, so down in the uh, bottom left down here, in the mini buffer, I should be getting hints, but I haven't enabled them. So enable concurrent hints allows um, the dispatcher to, to query for hints while a main loop is running. It's just, it's a setting inside um, Slim. So, oh yeah, so this is it. So we're gonna take some pipeline, the current camera and the delta and everything's back. Cool, so we're, we're, we're where we were a second ago. More or less caffeine, will this help the crap talking? Barrett asks, are you using any more goodies in terms of Emacs modes that we should be aware of? Um, I don't think so. I'm, I'm, I'm running a pretty bog standard setup. I mean, just slime with the normal kind of stuff turned on and I'm trying to think actually. I mean, obviously Peredit is a must and yeah, <laughs> what else is there? No, it's, it's Magit and Peredit. Those are probably the first two things I install. And then it's, yeah, I run a, I run a fairly bog standard setup. It's more just some of the Lisp libraries I'm using to, yeah, keep it all in check. Arev, I have no idea what Arev is. It's turned on. What is this? Auto revert. Interesting. Not sure what that is. We'll find out another time. I'm not going to start pressing too many buttons just in case I... <laughs> Fuck with my setup. But yeah, the, like the other things are, um, yeah, of, of course, editor config. That's the kind of just mandatory for working with other humans. And oh yeah, there, there's some stuff. I'll, I'll try and think of it. Oh yeah, the thing that lets you, uh, what is it? Zali's maths stuff. So you can type A and get alpha and B and get, oh, does it not do beta? Oh yeah, it's, I'm hitting the wrong key this way. Oh, it doesn't do capital. But yeah, beta and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I will try and remember if there's anything else, but I don't think so. Just little tweaks to make it feel, mainly to deal with me mistyping things. Um, okay, so what next? Right, so we're rendering the scene. Now we're gonna render the scene and we're gonna render using the light pipeline that we just defined over there. Um, we're going to use camera one, which is our orthographic camera. If we look down in the hints down in the bottom, that says orthographic camera and the delta. And we should get something else, but we didn't. Why? Have I bought something up there? Barrett, look what you made me do! What have I done? That's interesting. It's about time we had something go wrong. It's been going far too well. Yep, light pipeline, choosing sunburst stage, which was up here, and light frag stage, which is there. Come on, you Muppet, what have you done? Da, 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 da. Oh yeah, I'm an idiot. Okay, so we're uploading the uniforms to one pipeline and then rendering with another. Okay, that I was hoping. <laughs> Would have done it, but um, no such luck. Let's see, what else am I doing? Let's see if it works if I put it back how it was. Yes, so that bit's working. Everything's fine there. So it's something when I swap out for the light pipeline. Oh, of course, it's I'm an idiot. Of course I'm not seeing anything because I'm not outputting anything. That was the whole point of making this minimal fragment shader. 
if I go in here and replace this with red, I'm going to see red stuff. Um, and if I did it with camera one, yeah, so that will be one reason to leave the colors in there so you don't confuse yourself on a live stream and look like a Muppet. Okay, so anyway, that apparently is working now. And if we do nothing in here, it still should be capturing the depth information. So we're going to do that. So let's do with FBO bound. And then it was the light FBO, isn't it? And we're going to clear that FBO while we're here. I still haven't fixed that bug, which is why I'm explicitly specifying which FBO I want to clear. Um, no attachment at zero. That is... A, that is a correct um, error message, but a really bad one. So um, what it is, is when you, bound, when you bind the FBO, Keppel by default will set the current viewport to be the size of the FBO. It's just one of the kind of helper things it can do. And you can turn it off with, with viewport um, is nil, or providing your own. Um, but what I'm actually interested in, in to, to get the size, for the viewport, it has to look at one of the attachments. And by default, um, it looks at attachment zero, which is the first color attachment. We don't have one of those, so we're gonna tell it D, which is our depth attachment. And we compile that and we say continue, and now nothing's going wrong. But also nothing is exciting on the screen, so. But apparently it's working. And the way we're gonna check this is we're going to go draw text, which is a helper uh, function that we've got in Nineveh, which is our kind of standard library of useful stuff. We're going to pass it a sampler. And we see nothing. Hmm. Also doesn't bode well. So what am I missing in this case? Nope. That should be okay. Light sampler. Now I did see an interesting, sorry, I'm trying to remember um, the nature of this bug from the other day. When I had the error in, with the FBO being bound in the attachment thing, I think, I think it was leaving the, um, the context in a slightly strange state. Let me check this out. No, um, oh yes, here we go. Draw FBO and the read FBO should be um, in the main loop, should be the same, um, but they're not. This is also one of the nice side effects of having the uh, a caching uh, wrapper around the context is you can actually look at what things are set to. Um, that's a bug that should have, um, I'm gonna have to, uh, hey Jace, could you do me a favor? And um, just open an issue on Keppel saying that um, errors in um, with FBO bound are not um, uh, are not using unwind protect properly because I'm pretty sure that's it. I should have this stuff in an unwind protect that's stopping the stack fucking with stuff. Thanks, dude. That's awesome. Um, so anyway, yes, I want to get the. Um, Actually, we can just inspect this object again and we'll get what we need. So we want, let's just get the default FBO. And now we're gonna do a little bit of hacking. So set the, what is it? Keppel, oh, where is this gonna be? Keppel.context and it'll be the Keppel, probably this actually, Keppel. Context draw FBO binding um, of capital context to that. There we go. Right, I'll have that fixed very soon because that's super shitty. Um, it's it really is just I've got I've got the wrong thing in the wrong scope. <laughs> Darius, the bots are getting pretty good these days, man. As soon as a uh, as soon as Google can just make a thousand <laughs> Jaces, we'll all be out. A thousand? I think we'll need more. We need an army of them. Okay, so this is what we're looking to capture anyway. This is meant to be the depth information, apparently. 
hard to tell. Um, one of the things is, again, say we're very far away. And that's because that viewport is the same size as the texture, which is 1024 by 1024. We want to make that smaller. So um, we're going to need to change the size of something on the camera. Let's have a look at the camera. We have a frame size. How is it used? Okay, so at the moment, all it does is when it's computing the projection, it either looks for the frame size or takes the current viewport size. That makes sense. So what we'll do is we'll take camera one. Um, and what did they do in the tutorial? Okay, ortho was 10 by 10, something like that. So the total diameter was 20 by 20. So let's do that. Let's say that we'll take camera one and we'll get its, what do we call it, frame size? Yeah, frame size, which is currently nil. And we'll set it to 20 by 20. And now it's pointing in an interesting direction. Okay. Um, let's go back to the place where we say, uh, where we can update the camera. So this is where we update the camera. Let's say for now that, what, what is current camera right now? It's the perspective camera. Set F current camera to be camera one again, and that will give us control and we should be able to look around. Oops. Oh, there's our, uh, there's our terrain and there's our boxes. Nice. So we want something like this. Yeah, let's leave it like that. That's cool. So that's the depth information. This is how far away all of those things are from our light. Um, if we've got that right, hopefully. Um, what we could do to check, make sure this view is not completely insane. Um, if we quickly fuck with this. And we're going to leave the clear there. It won't make any difference. Um, we'll do this. We'll turn off that debug thing. Let's go back to render and in the, let's just switch back quickly to some frag stage. Oh, did that not work? Why not? I don't know. I thought that would have worked. Oh, I'm clearing afterwards. That's why you map it. Okay, there we are. So yeah. If we go down to some brag stage, here we can see what the light would be seeing. Now we go to our don't draw anything version. And then we can just undo all this stuff we just screwed with. Ba -bum 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 -bum. And we're back in business. Cool. So this is the depth information. Nice. So that bit wasn't too bad. I'm stare at you lovely people and then we'll get back to work. Barrett's linking things again. Do I trust you? Uh, this is one of those useful times to have a bot around just telling you what the actual names of the things are. Thanks for that, Shin. That's really helpful. <laughs> right. Oh, right. Let's... Uh... Let's carry on. Okay, so we've got the depth information. Now, what we want to do is, well, the first thing we can just do is render the scene as normal. Some pipeline with the regular camera. And, oh yeah, what's, what is current camera right now? It's the orthographic, so let's change that back to normal. So this should be working, cool. This is our view. So now, this is where things get a little interesting. So we need to know um, in our fragment shader, we're gonna want to know for every fragment that we're rendering, um, what its position is, like um, according to the light. So we're going to need two bits of information. We want to calculate this position, which we're doing right now, the position in um, like 
in clip space. The, no, so, okay. Wind back. Not explaining things very well. It's like I haven't done this before. Okay, so... This second pass, we're rendering this scene. We want to see it from our camera. Uh, and to do that, we're taking all our vertices, we're transforming them by the model to world, world to view, view to clip matrices, our normal shebang, um, before passing them onto our fragment shader. And obviously, in between your vertex and fragment, uh, you get the parts of the pipeline, the fixed function parts of the pipeline, like divide by W and all this kind of stuff. Um, so that's just what getting that's what's getting us these positions. But as well as all this, we need to know the position for every fragment. We want the position as if it was being looked at from the light. So we need in light space, we need to know all these positions as well. So, so this is kind of in a camera kind of space or a viewport space. Now we need light space. The thing is, we've done this before. We did it in the first the first pass. Before it's just we passed in, or was it? The um, the world to view matrix. Where is it? And the view to clip matrices for our camera. So all we really want is the world to view and view to clip matrices of the the light camera. So the other one. Ah oh, man, that is it's really faffy to explain, but I hope it'll become clear when I just do it. So all I'm going to do is duplicate this for a start, and we'll say. Um, I'm going to just say world to light and light to clip. And this is going to be for that other camera, the one we're using as a light. So this is our orthographic camera. So as well as whatever camera we're uploading, um, the trans... The, um... <laughs> Why is this so hard to say? It's so clear in my head. Yeah, I just can't make it into fucking words. Okay, yeah. We want the transform to take a vertex not just into our camera space, but also into the light space. Um, and seeing as that light is being represented by essentially this camera, we're passing that up too. Um, that also means we need some uniforms for this. So in here, let's add a couple more uniforms. Oh no, not in here, in the vertex stage. So it's world to light, map four, and light to clip. Is there anything else to think about there? No, let's compile that and then compile this. Nothing's freaking out because we haven't done anything wrong yet. So then what? So then as well as calculating... So ultimately we calculate this clip position here and we, we split everything up before because in the stream that we wrote this, we were just explaining how these transforms worked. And yeah, I've forgotten how to explain them now. Good stuff. Progress is made. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the pass in light space. And the way we're going to do that is we are going to do, we're going to multiply by, we're going to take the world position of our vertex. So we, the vertex comes in, we transform it from model space into world space. Then we transform that into uh, the view space of the light camera. And then we transform it into the uh, kind of clip coordinates for that light camera. And then all we're going to do is we're going to stick this onto the, the list of values that we're returning from this vertex stage. And now it's complaining because the values that are coming out of this stage do not match this stage, the one they're feeding into. So it's giving us an error as to saying, here's your GLSL code. Really, it should show the Lisp code. I should actually catch this earlier and throw an error that's more Lispy. But what it does say is, um, yeah, mismatch between shader stages. So it's not the most confusing error in the world. So we're just going to do this. And it's a VEC4. I think it's a better be a VEC4. Should be. That'll do. <laughs> Compile this and then we need to go and update our pipelines. Because our pipelines currently think that this just takes three arguments, but now it takes a vector four as well. 
We can just do, do this while it's waiting. Oh, have we not compiled that light frag stage yet? Oh no, that's correct. This one doesn't yet take that. That's a valid error. Fuck you for being right. Oh, the invitation's weird. It's very important we fix that now. Why, Chris? Why? Okay, so get rid of this. Compile this. That was happy. Compile this. That was fine. Go back to this error and say continue. And everything's kosher again. Cool. And just to satisfy myself, if I go over to the REPL and just do a CLS, um, which will bank... The, well, it'll actually... It'll call clear on the um, default FBO and then swap and then do it again. Um, so you'll see that little flash. It's just to prove to myself that everything's still running. Um, what's going on here? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a good chat, but there's not really much point in me reading out. You should come to the streams, you on YouTube. You should wake up at awkward times like Barrett does. Just to see me gibber quietly to myself. Right, so what is going on here? Um, right, it'd be cool to make a sundial clock with GLSL that has the positions of the light using system clock. Oh, that's, that's actually a really funky idea. I like that. We should do that. Um... Interesting uh, why you can buy individual functions rather than the whole buffer. Normally because... Um, why do I do that? It tends to be just... I, I like compiling the thing I'm working on because I'm localizing the damage if I've screwed up more things. I mean, I will end up just recompiling this buffer at some point. Um, but, yeah, see, I can do this. Everything recompiles and comes back. But yeah, I like just... Focusing, yeah, limiting my blast radius, essentially. Okay, so... We haven't screwed anything up. We now have... In the fragment uh, stage... We have the position in light space. So this is where we're going to have to go back to the tutorial. Um, because the next thing to do is work out for, every posi for all these positions... If our position in light space is further away than in that um, in that depth buffer we captured in the other FBR. Which also means we're going to have to pass that up. So let's bring up the light sampler, because that's what we called it. Compile that, everything's fine. And uh, yes, back to the tutorial. Okay, so we have done, essentially, all of this stuff. We don't have to worry about doing... The funky details of GL that's done for us by Keppel. And all this stuff, and this stuff, and yep, all of this. And all of this, maybe? Yep, we've done this too. Okay, so we're down here. This interesting bit here. Shadow calculation is what we want to know, which is down here. Okay, so the... I'm going to jump to this version because this is the full this is the full function I'm looking for, but we'll work through it. So the first thing is our um, positions, our vertex positions that we returned from our vertex stage, um, like I say, have gone through the um, perspective divide. So you take this is a vector four, and it takes the x, y, z and divides it by the w. This does not happen to any of the other values being passed on. Um, because this is your GL position, essentially. This is an important one. Um, and so these guys, sorry, these guys who get passed into these four arguments here have not had the perspective divide, which is really useful, except for now, when we need to be comparing things like for like. So let's make a function, a GPU function, for calculating the shadow factor, which is going to return a number between 0 and 1 to say how in shadow it is. Um, it's going to need some things. It's going to need, well, it's going to need that position in light space for a start. It's going to need um, the light sampler. 
and maybe that's it. And for now, we'll just say it's totally in shadow, right? And then we'll come down here. And what we're going to do is we'll calculate the factor, the, whoops, not there, shadow factor is just calling the shadow factor function with the light sampler and with the position in light space. And then we're going to, we're not going to multiply the ambient by it because ambient gets everywhere, including into your shadows. Uh, but we have the dip, the diffuse and the specular, which is commented out because everything looked kind of crappy. But we'll leave, we'll put it on for now. Um, we add those together, and then we multiply them. Yeah, spaces, man. We multiply them by the shadow factor, and that should be it. So right now, oh sorry, uh, one means not in shadow at all. Zero means in shadow. So here we can see just the ambient light. And here is full light of whatever. Cool. So so normally what we would do is we'd take our light position that we're doing all this specular and fongy type shit from and we'll put it at the same place as our camera. And that will make everything match up. We'll do that later. Um, we need to do this calculation. So the first thing was we want to... Um, what does he call it? The projected chords. Projected chords is the uh, position in light space and we're going to swizzle it and from that we're going to get the x, y and z coordinates and then we're going to divide that by the w from the position in light space. So we're just doing the same thing um, that, part, that fixed function part of the pipeline will be doing. And then once we've got that, oh yes, so at the moment that is because of uh, the way clip space is defined, currently that point is going to be in the range minus one to one. And we want it, because we're going to use this for texture coordinates, they go from zero to one, so we need to remap that. And the way you do that is we're going to say the projected coordinates are multiplied by 0.5 and then add Vector 3, 0.5. Cool. Oh, yep, we've got a let with an empty body. That's not allowed in, in uh, Vari code. So that still works. Everything's kosher. Then I'm going to look at chat. People are saying things. Right. Oh, Pixel Outlaws come in. Hey man, how you doing? Uh, current project today is, yes, it is actually shadow mapping. That's what we're doing. Um, so what we've done so far is we've got an orthographic camera, the one from like the other weeks. Uh, we've set it up out here somewhere in our scenes down here. Um, but on camera, you know, because I'm a professional. Um, we're capturing, we're rendering from that position all of this stuff. All of, ah, beyond the right machine. There we go, all of this stuff. Uh, we're rendering from the position of the light, uh, but we're only capturing the depth information and FBO. And now we're rendering this part, but we're finding out if a each texel is further away in that uh, than the depth map says. And that means it's in shadow, which would be cool. If it works, if it works. Um, Sergeant Grief, how do you even compile the buffer? Yeah, control C, control K, that's it. So good. Actually, I might end up adding that to the um, Atom plugin. Oh, it's really sad. There's an Atom plugin that's kind of on the way and it's stalled a bit and it's such a shame. Uh, I don't know why. I, I guess it's just the dude hasn't had time. I mean, it's really fill for him, but it's like, oh, it'd be so good if we can just get Atom support. Atom or VS Code. But I mean, let's, like, Atom 1 is already well started and is working, just needs love. Um... <laughs> Bag is not nearly enough finger pointing today. I know, like all this great stuff that's going on that you can see. Um, I'm really trying to remember that. I really wish the Atom plugin actually worked. I get it to the point where I can connect and I can compile code, but they don't have the compile whole buffer yet and all this kind of stuff. I just need to, I would, 
It's a problem. It's a really boring job. When you could be writing Lisp instead, you're having to write JavaScript. And, or is it TypeScript? Oh, no, TypeScript's for VS Code. It's CoffeeScript for Adam, isn't it? Blah. I mean, not to shit on languages and everything, but I mean, like, I, I, I wasn't around for the period of time that Coffee, CoffeeScript made sense. Because it really doesn't seem to now. Anyway, rather than throwing shade, let's make shade. Um... We have, okay, so we, now we're gonna read the depth according to the light. That's fine, we can do that, super easy. So um, light depth, I don't like that name, so I'm gonna go with this one. Light depth is, so we're gonna texture. This is the function to sample from a texture. Should be called sample something, I don't know. Um, not, sorry sample the light sampler and we're going to sample it at swizzle again projected coordinates x y um, that's good is there anything else to do oh yes we just need the x component because that texture obviously returns a vector four um, but our depth is just a single float so we only want the X component. And then what do we do? What do the instructions say? We get R depth, okay, which is Z. That's fine. So is it text on? No. Frag depth, probably not the best name. Let's just do R depth, <laughs> which is the Z coordinate of the um, projected chords. And then it should be simple, right? It should just be if the current depth is greater than than the closest depth. So if our depth is greater than the light depth, yeah. So factor is if our depth is greater than the light depth, then we're further away. And that means, so he's saying we should do one to zero and then returns that shadow and pretty sure he inverts it straight away yeah one minor shadow when it's being used or we can just do zero if it's further away and one if it's that and then return the factor and that's sort of things <laughs> i mean it's not right but it's something what have we got going on there that's interesting oh wait a second i done fucked up because when i'm moving this camera all the shadows are moving which means shared state both of our cameras are have the same ah have the same vectors As well, the closure, people are just laughing. Everyone in Haskell's laughing. Look at him with his shared state and his controllable amounts of memory. Um, okay, so let's do this again. Let's reposition. Where do we want to be? We want our camera to be over here somewhere. Yeah, this would be a cool place for the camera to be. Right here. I'm going to wiggle it around until it's like that. Okay, and then let's go back to the ripple and set up position of camera one to be the position of camera. This is how you get yourself into a mess to begin with. So then you just wrap it and make a new vector and that's fine. And same goes for rotation. And now, silly as that looks. Oh, fuck. What? Oh, am I still updating the wrong camera? That would suggest that current camera is the orthographic camera. What? What is going on?
Well, they're definitely not the same. So I've screwed something else up then. Interesting. Well, the good news, of course, is we've got something related to shadows going on. Bad news is everything else is fucking up. For a minute, it looked okay, though, because one of the things we're going to have to deal with is something called shadow acne. Which is strange. <laughs> Ponderpip's arrived. Hey, man. Audio and video okay. Thank you, sir. You're a tad late. But, uh, no, that's great. Good to have you, man. Okay, so... I got close to somewhere, and now it's screwing up, and I'm not sure why. Um, I guess the thing I can do is look at the position of the orthographic camera, and then move some... Move a bit, and then check it again. Oops. And see that it's the same. That bit's good. Um, rotation of camera one, and then move this, and... Rotation of camera ones is still the same. Okay, so that isn't the problem. What is the problem then? It suggests that I'm passing in the wrong camera to here. No, I'm passing in camera one. Is there anything else using current camera rather than like the global variable of current camera rather than just Passing it around. Nope. Pretty much nope. That's the only place that's using it. The yeah, there's the definition of current camera. Then there's reset current camera. Which makes sense. Sorry, reset camera. And then there's this update. If those values aren't changing, then what am I screwing up? I could be passing the wrong thing in here. Let's just make sure. Yep, camera one still is the orthographic camera. That's good. Um, that's really strange. It suggests that the contents of that FBO are changing um, let's just go back to based on where my other camera is looking, which is really wrong. Um, let's add back that um, draw text. Draw text, uh, was it light sampler? Put it in the bottom right. Okay, that's not changing. Cool, so at least that bit's not fucked. It's something else. Wow. I wonder what it is. Weird. It isn't just me not compiling things. All right, in the, before I go about fixing this, I should actually uh, upload this. Um, oh no, we actually haven't made a branch for this yet either. So, uh, what episode are we today? 18. Episode 18. pushed. So now to find out what I've screwed up. Which will be interesting. Wait a second. Light to clip. World to view. World to light. That's better. Okay, so now we got 
really janky looking shadows going on and other artifacts as well which we'll deal with in a minute as you can see this is repeating which we'll come to so we will consult the guides and the chat because we're doing all right time wise at the moment it's only nearly nine o'clock okay well, what's going on here Shit saying that it needs to do some video editing and everything on Linux is a garbage fire. That is still sadly true. I mean, it's... It, oh, it, it is really disappointing. I, I've, I've given up. That's why I do these streams the way I do now. Like, the only... I leave them completely unedited except the first minute, 10 minutes I chop off because it's just such a nightmare to do. On almost anything, actually. Mac is surprisingly fucking terrible for editing video unless you're spending, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds or oh, subscribing to something. Um, <laughs> recompile the buffer. I did! I did! It didn't fix it! Yeah, Mac is even worse than Windows. Yeah, that's just that's so much bullshit on that. Like, where are people creating things? I suppose that hasn't been true for a long time, though. So I'm just going on old Mac arguments. Da 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 da. <laughs> Shin's not a fan of Blender. I like Blender. I don't use it much. That's probably why I like it. But I, I like the idea. I very much love the idea of it. I did some scripting in there before and I really enjoyed it. Well, it was actually doing the uh, tree generation stuff I did in Blender originally many years back. Yeah, it's actually surprising how quick you can kill most video editing software. It's like, just give it a video. It's, I don't, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, Windows Movie Maker shouldn't be an option, but it's... Because all, all you ever want, like, I don't know, not all I ever want to do, but a lot of the time what I want to do is stick a title on the front, fade in, like, edit things down a little to remove the bits of me going, uh, and then that's it. That's all I need. It's such a simple task. But, um, yeah. OBS is fucking awesome. Yes, agreed. Capture is not a problem anymore. <laughs> Video editing Kebel. Fuck that! <laughs> we'll not be doing... It might be, it might be actually fun to do video textures, though. We could do an episode on that sometime. Like, streaming in video. But, actually, the majority of the work is actually just going to be setting up the texture. I mean, like... Once you get it into video memory, there's no challenge. Put the texture on the thing, probably. Ah, I'm saying that. This is the wrong thing to say because I'll get a thousand messages of like, do you know how hard this is? There's people whose job is just doing like video encoding and stuff for games and all like, they make good shit. But uh, yeah, for a simple, like one of these two hour episodes, I'm not sure it'd be that exciting. Right, anyway, if we go down a little bit, we will see something rather familiar. This garbage. This is called Shadow Acne, and the reason it happens is that we have, I mean, they have a drawing that kind of does it for, does it for me. Basically, we've captured this information over here, but the area we're rendering is likely bigger than this. So we're getting multiple texels here um, are getting mapped to one, uh, sorry, one, multiple fragments here are getting mapped to one texel over here. So... If, oh, I haven't started, I haven't started the doodle -o The general concept is, though, that I'm just, I'm just not a fan of that diagram for explaining it. Um, so you have from here um, one fragment. And it has, so wait a second, yeah, we're going to have, I'm trying to remember which way around this is, multiple fragments are getting mapped into one texel in here. So this value of depth is going to be constant for this entire area. And some of these, obviously there's a difference, so this might be zero and this might be, well, actually, Let's say this is 
the depth here is five and this is six and this is five. So it was correct for this um, texel here, but suddenly this one is considered below the floor and is in shadow. So basically we have the, the detail is here is too resolute is too low resolution and so some of the things are getting decided to be under the under the floor turns out this is actually quite hard to explain <laughs> or i'm just not in an explaining kind of place today but this is what they're saying that um for each of the te the fragments we're doing here um the depth values are going to be different across this space so some of them um are essentially like the information saying that it's under the ground and then it's above the ground it's underground above the ground and so all we do is we shove a little bias on there a fudge factor that essentially raises everything slightly up and um then it just looks better the fudge factors of course break in different circumstances and we're going to see that here is our shadow factor so what we're going to do is where do we apply that so it's going to be in our depth we add 0 0.05, 0 0.05, boop. That went the wrong way though. I got that wrong. Oh yeah, sorry, minus, isn't it? Otherwise we're putting everything further away. We minus it by a very small amount. And so now we get less of that garbage, but we've added fudge factors. So we're gonna have issues, but look, things casting shadows on things. Ah, oh, it's lovely, but it's really boring having them all static. So let's just do a thing quickly so they're not. Um, things, we really need to do this now, do we? No, we're gonna do it anyway. Set up the Y position of, the Y position of the thing to be sign, it's always sign sign of now and so they're going up and down and then we are going to add some number depending on which one it is so let's find the position of this thing in the list of things that's going to return a number that's going to give them a slight offset then the y position let's raise it up away so seven yeah, there it is. And then we'll multiply the sign value by five or something. And hopefully, yeah, then we'll see things casting on each other. Now, first problem, like another problem, not first problem. There's plenty of problems. First problem, why are we writing this all in this? Because it's awesome, that's why. Right, so first problem is duplicate shadows over here. And the reason is we're sampling outside of this texture and the current texture sampling settings, let's go and have a look. REPL, give me a REPL uh, for the light um, sampler. If we look at the wrap settings for the light sampler, we can see the repeat. So every time it goes outside this, it starts sampling from the other side. So you get far enough and it's just going to be sampling this again and again and again. So we set it to something else. And to find out what the possible values are, you can use the Keppel documentation. Look at it. There's some more than nothing. Right. So. We look at wrapping and we can see our options are repeat, mirrored repeat, which we don't want either. It's going to be the same problem. Clamp to edge, clamp to border. I think we'll try clamp to border. Texture coordinate is clamped to, from zero to one range, but the edge texels are blended with a constant border color. That actually sounds wrong because we don't want to blend with a constant border color. We want it just to be, yeah, we just want to, when we get to the edge, just keep on using the value that's at the edge. Let's try that. Bam. Why did I do that? Doesn't matter. Continue anyway. There. Right. So most of the, well, all the repeaters has gone away, but we've still got this guy out, out here. And the reason for that is that, okay, so we've got a couple of things actually. Ah, no, this, maybe this is the reason for the constant border color because, hmm. One of the things that can happen, if it, if it gets too far away, um, then it's going to be considered to be in shadow again. I think that's mentioned in here, actually. Let's go have a look. 
Oh yeah, there's another issue group, Peter Panning, because essentially we've lifted everything up slightly now with that bias. Um, oh, and there's more to the bias as well. Fuck, I should actually read these instructions. We'll come to this in a second, because it looks kind of okay. Um, yeah, so shadow acne. We use a shadow bias. And then we still got this garbage out here. And he talks about GL repeat. So he does clamp to border. Achieve this by storing a border color and set them. Uh, okay, yes. So we need to set a border color. Hey, I don't actually know if I've wrapped that up in um, Kettle properly. Texture border color. Interesting. Wow. Is that a that's a text parameter okay yeah it says texture parameters that must be available in the sampler parameters as well damn might have a missing feature to add here might be another job for jace jace get ready there might be more issues for you to log capital rep border No, this is just the documentation for the sampler. To do border color. Ah, shit. <laughs> Thanks, past me. You're fucking me over on a stream. Okay. Um, yeah, let's. We might just leave that for another time because I can't be asked to deal with that now. So we will fix that. And then the other one is um, the dark region that he's got here. This is because some things are past the um, far plane. And so then it becomes a problem. Yes, so if projected coordinate Z is greater than one, shadow equals zero. Again, all these ifs in here aren't particular, particularly nice, but it'll do for now. Um, good enough for the stream. What is it? Our depth is greater than one. It's not going to make any difference to us because none of our stuff is far enough away to be the problem. But that's technically it. Um, and something I just want to check as well because I'm always curious. I've got this. I added this a while ago, which was to. Um, when you wrote ifs, if they were short enough, it would use. Um, oh, what's it called? Ternary operators. To when it compiles to GLSL. I just want to see if that's working. So if I just do shadow factor and it takes a sample 2D and a VEC4. Yes, cool. Both of these are using ternary. Oh, that's all right. Nice. I can live with that shader code. That's all right. What next? What next? What next? Okay, so... Yeah, one of the issues that he mentioned, other than the... Obviously, everything look, looks a bit shitty. Partially because we've got um, no anti-aliasing. And it will be a lot easier to see if I just stop them for a minute. But basically, our shadows are pretty low resolution. They actually don't look too terrible here because we're using um, a pretty... Well, we're using 1024 by 1024 um, texture in our FBO. And our resolution here is fucking tiny. So they look okay. But normally you'll see like in this, like here, they look really jaggy on the edges. Let's see, like this. This is what this would look like if it was a reasonable resolution. So you want to fix that up. 
And that's what we can do now here. Basically, you do a really basic blur. Uh, but there was something else here as well. It was mentioning Peter Panning. And, oh, yes. Yeah, so, and this bit's kind of annoying. So I need to read this. So because we've got that shadow bias, you're applying an offset to the depth of the objects. So if your bias gets a bit wrong, it look like essentially it looks like the shadows make it look like your object's floating. So gap here. So essentially it's, it's rendering the shadow as if this box was about here, which sucks. Um, and it says that the way to fix this is to use back face culling. Uh, sorry, with front face culling rather than back face culling. But I don't get why. And like, I mean, it kind of... Okay, because we only need depth values for the depth map, it shouldn't matter for solid objects whether we take the depth of the front faces or the back faces. Yeah, that's fine. Using the back faces depths doesn't give wrong results as it doesn't matter if we have shadows inside the objects, we can't see there anyway. Okay, yeah. I guess, so you're biasing from here rather than from here? Is that the idea? So you're biasing... Um, only solves it for solid objects, yeah, but that makes sense, because you're going to be using front rather than... If, you, if, you, if your objects aren't solid, then when you change which face you're culling, that's going to fuck that up anyway, so I'm not worried about that. But we can do it. I mean, that's... I, I just... I don't entirely understand the logic for that, so if you understand it, please let me know. I'd love to know. Let's go back to our Play With Vert stuff, and it's just this one. So we can do with set f. We not got that library? Maybe not. Oops. Quick load with set f. There we go. Let's add this to our project's dependencies. Play with verts ASD. And in our package, we'll use it. With set f, the place is, what is the function we use for this? Um, curl face for the current context is back. Okay, so I guess we're just gonna set that to front. This should have documentation. It doesn't have good documentation. That sucks. All right, that's more things for me to do. Proper documentation. Um, okay, so curl face. Yeah, so we're gonna set curl face to front rather than back. Then we're gonna render and then with setf it's going to return it to whatever value it was originally. Fine. It's a... Uh... Ooh! And you can see it not work when things go through the floor. So that's good to know. It fails harder when things go, go through the floor. Learning. Right, so let's just... <laughs> Fuck it, we'll just make things not go through the floor. Ah, but it also matters, obviously, not just going through the floor when they intersect with each other. Ah, that's interesting. I mean, that makes perfect sense. The floor isn't special. It's just another thing, like all of these objects. Um, you know what? I mean, that may be co the correct thing to do. But for the rest of the stream, I'm not interested in positioning things so they don't have these issues. Um, so I'm going to take that out. And just let them... I'll have slight Peter Panning problems, and I don't care too much. They're saying that they do flicker a bit when they go through, but that might just be the shape of the object. Um, we could add a sphere as well and just see that how that works. We could do that in a minute. Anyway, what's happening in chat? What's happening without coffee? Damn. Uh, Jace, sorry, yes, border texture colors, please. Um, that was... That's what I needed. And I'm not going to screw with them on the stream. Because it's just... It, it'll be fairly quick, but fairly boring to implement. And the result's going to be, yeah, this tiny triangle. The, the, 
There's the pointing device. This tiny triangle up here is gonna look, is gonna go away. I think we can, I think we can use an imaginations there. Alcama's saying, well, there's an advertisement on Twitch now. Yeah, man, they've been, they've been shoving adverts on there for quite a while, I think. I always get it when I go to Ferris streams. Um, nice, thank you, man. That's really good. Okay. This is actually where I wanted to get to on this stream, so... What do we do now? Um, I guess we implement that basic blur to soften off the edges. I actually want to see the artifact that they're getting more explicitly in ours. So I'm going to change some things. Um, let's break some stuff. Render. Oh, no, actually, before we do this, seeing as we've got something working, push. Push. It works. Right. So that's gone. And what now? Oh yeah. Light FBO2, light sampler 2, compile those. Let's get this up to a decent size again. Let's go and make an FBO. And this time we're gonna have a lower resolution. Let's just do 512 by 512. Um, set F light sum light FBO2. To something, you can't just set it to nothing. Why is it throw errors in your face? And rightly so. Okay, so now we're gonna set up the light sampler too to be same shit as before. Sample the attachment text of light FBO2, attachment D. Yep, that should be fine. Okay, so both of those are populated now. And wherever we were using this, we're just going to swap it out for the other one. Quite a few places. Oh, we don't care about that. Doot, doot, doot. Light FBO2, light FBO2. So now it's rendering into light FBO2, so these have all become static because not updating, not using like FBO2 for this yet. Um, the debug drawing down here, now we can do light sampler two and we can see now over here, everything's moving again, which is good. Um, and then we will go to, was oh, that it? Yeah, that was it. And all the other ones are just the definitions. Really? Oh no. Like, yeah, that's light pos. Cool. Hopefully now we'll have slightly jankier shadows. Yeah, so if we look at those coming down, I'm not sure if it shows up on the stream. They're a lot biddier than before. Let's, um... Da, 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 da. Where do we want to go? Things. Look at that. Ain't it pretty? So that's the kind of shit that you're going to see often. And so what they normally do, or they, it seems to be done <laughs> a lot, is to have um, cascading shadow maps. So you have multiple different resolutions. So where your core character or the core camera is facing, they'll have a very high resolution map. And then they're going to have a, another one of a similar size or a much larger area and a much larger area again. And it will sample it based out of... Yeah, out of the most appropriate, the most detailed one for that given area. It's it's like it's a detail on top of this. And we might implement it on one of the streams because it'd be kind of cool to do, but I'm not worried about doing it today. Um, so let's zoom in on that because that's the interesting case. Doot, doot, doot. And let's get rid of our debug shares. So we can focus on this. And let's go and go for our stretch goals on this stream and implement the last part. I didn't think we'd be getting this far, this is nice. Um, so yeah, 
Everything looks a bit garbage, so what we're going to do is we're going to sample nearby texels and blur them. Oh no, there was something I forgot. Wait a second. Um, up here, when we did the bias, a constant bias works in some situations but not others. So, but one of the things you can do is you can base the bias on the angle the camera is looking at the surface. Really simple. You just take the dot product of the uh, normal of the surface and the direction to the light, and then you're going to get the yeah, you're going to get something to multiply your bias by. In fact, I'm not going to worry about doing this. It's pretty trivial. Uh, this is the kind of thing we've done quite a few times. It's just, yeah, essentially said it's like a projection of one vector onto another, which is cool. You might do it, you might do it later, but this is actually a little more interesting. Oh, not how he's doing it though. Yuck. Okay. So, just unroll this loop, man. Um, the idea is we're just gonna sample. Yeah, we're gonna sample nearby texels. And shadows, current depth minus bias, greater than PCF depth. Okay. And shadow divided equals by nine. Oh yeah, for the number of samples. You know what, let's just take this and go implement it. And then the other option would be doing orthographic, because currently we're doing orthographic projection, so it's perfect for a directional light. Um, but a lot of lights in your game are going to be point lights or kind of cone lights and things like this. So in those cases, you use perspective projection, and you have to do a little bit to um, deal with the fact that your depth buffers are going to be non-linear at that point due to how projection matrices work. But we don't need to do that yet. Um, so let's go and see if we can soften up these shadows and then I'm going to call it a day if we've got some time um, Not I don't have to turn off the stream What we'll probably do is we'll call the shadow mapping a success because I don't want to get because the problem is because if I start on another bit Then it fucks up. I'm gonna to have to end the stream on a broken stuff and that's gonna be kind of demotivating I want to leave it with something kind of working So once we've got this working I'm opening up for any Kepley kind of questions or any other fucking around we can do this stream okay let's implement this so the idea is we're going to have a shadow thing at zero uh, a texel size which is one divided by the oh right texture size is a function I didn't know GLSL had that that's cool Actually, need to go look that up. Wait a second, what's going on? GLSL texture size. It's not going to be spelt like that. It's going to be like this. There we go. Nice. Well, that's handy. Now I need to find out that you can get the viewport size just in the fragment shader, and I feel like a complete idiot. Um, I want to know now. Viewport size fragment window size in GLSL built in variable fragment shader inputs so you get fragment shader ID okay so there isn't one for that I thought that was the case well, at least we get texture size, that'll do. Okay, so one over texture size of um, light sampler. No! What? That feels stupid. Uh, let's the works, GLSL spec. Texture size is there. Did I type it wrong? No. I 
Actually, let's split horizontally. I want to get that error up again. Um, SLD, SLDB. There's no applicable method for the GLSL function. Um, there's no applicable method. There's no applicable function. Um, or implementation, surely. The texture size when cooled with sampler 2D. Does it have two arguments? Probably does, doesn't it? Probably just forgetting some. Level of detail. Ah, but it should be able to take it without a level of detail. What are the odds that I'm missing some definitions from my, from GLSR spec? GLSR spec functions dot lisp. Okay, so. Yep. Looks like all of the ones I have here. Oh no, wait a second. Yeah, I'm, prob I'm probably missing some implementations of texture size. Seems like I have ones for iSampler 2D. No, here we go, oh yeah. Sampler 2D, but with LOD specified. I don't have the one for Sampler 2D without LOD specified. Okay, so that's another ticket. Hey, Chase, want to save the day again? Um, could, you, could you file another issue for me? And uh, well, you can file it on Keppel, but uh, the actual repo is um, GLSL spec. And it's just that um, not all um, variants of texture size are, uh, are recorded. So I'll fix that. But anyway, what we can do in the short term is we can just tell it the LOD. So now when we compile this, it's going to complain about divide instead, which is fine. That's a separate problem. Okay, so. Let's get back to, oh no, I've already copied the source up here. I don't need to be farting around with this stuff. Ah, nice. So, now I can write these as for loops. I could potentially write them as do times though. No, I actually need, to. okay, so let's, let's do this. Let's do um, x is minus one for, so while x is less than equal to one and while, yeah, then plus plus x, something like that. It's not the prettiest thing. Uh, I, I need to implement more looping constructs in Vario. But the reason I've steered away with that is every time I think about it, I think about implementing loop, uh, compi compiling loop to GLSL. And then I think that's complete madness. And then I end up spending like 20 minutes thinking about what subset of, of uh, the loop macro I could do in GLSL. And then I just do something else. So that's why I haven't implemented more of the standard looping constructs in Vario yet. But we'll get there. And then inside this, we're going to have another loop. Um, y um, now what set f oh no it's not set f it's let pcf depth is texture light sampler and then it's our projected coordinates again Well, that's not changing, so um, we'll just say UV is this sample plus UV, and then it's our little offsets, which is X and Y, multiplied by texel size. So if we're going to be doing this, let's. UV plus off. What? Right. Let's take this.
Oh yeah, that's meant to be texel size, not texture size. Read it, Chris. Okay, and PCF depth, UV plus offset. Just like before, we're just going to take the X coordinate of that. Um, and then shadow, an increment shadow, destructively, um, by. So it's. Hold on, one second. Current depth, which is not that, which is our depth. Um, minus. Oh, wait a second. This is this order of operation stuff that I just hate in other languages. I just never remember it for, for everything. So is this current depth minus bias is greater than this? Or is this? Yeah, it's gotta be actually. Um, no, that's right, that's right, okay. So if um, something is, so it's going to be our depth minus bias, which we'll have to fix as well. So is greater than PCF depth, what a weird name. Then it's, we're going to say zero and one. We're doing it backwards from, from them, so that should be fine. Okay, now what can we strip out the rest of it? We don't need um, this factor stuff anymore. Um, we keep our depth. We, do we need light depth? Where are we using that? Nope, that's the sampling we don't use anymore. Projected chords is still right. Text size, yada, 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 yada. Okay. And then the final thing is shadow divided by nine. Bias is undefined. Oh, fuck. Of course it is. Bias is 0.005. There we go. And if you adjust your monitors, you can now see we've got blurry ugly shit, rather than just ugly shit. But a little bit of a distance, and maybe with some anti-aliasing or something on there, maybe it'll look okay. But the good news is that is the blurring. I mean, we can do something smarter than this. This is a very... Very simple blur, but it does the job. We're just we're essentially taking the same crap a few times and laying it on top of each other. So you're going to see essentially amounts to, yeah, nine offset copies of it. But that was what we wanted to achieve. So let's go back here. And instead of zero, we replace this with now. And everything should be moving. And so even though we're using a slightly lower resolution texture than before. We're still getting some nice softness on the edges. It's a bit nutty. Yes, indeed. Um, do isn't very specialized, which makes things like ittering from zero to n minus one unnecessarily verbose and error Yeah, um, yeah, those are the kind of things that I just I need I need to. I need to bring it in. Oh, sorry. You're saying that do is elevated similar. You're saying do is annoying. Um, <laughs> Baron has meta children. <laughs> Shimera, hey, don't you? Children are imbeciles. He knows because he, knows he is one. Yep. Oh, man. I, yeah. I don't want to be a parent. Yeah, I don't think I've used, I barely ever used do, I just use the loop macro everywhere. Like, I'm either doing recursion or doing map, or I'm just using the loop macro. And the loop macro just works so much of the time. And I, again, should learn iterate or should learn whatever. I'm sure Shimera's made a iteration library as well, but I haven't. I haven't done Why not plain old do? Because I just haven't implemented it, Phil. That's the only reason. And I should, like, that's the thing. I want as much of common as, as we can have. Um, I want it to work in Vario, and I want it to work in our shaders. I want the loop macro, macro 
Everything that could work from the loop macro, I want that to work. But that the loop macro spec is difficult at best. Um, who has done some work on that? Oh, why am I not remembering his name? Wonderful dude. Works with bike a lot. Oh, what's his name? Somebody help me out here. He did a talk on um, implementing the loop macro in the 2016 um, ELS Symposium. And it is gone out of my head. Lives down in Bordeaux. Lovely dude. I can, I can remember details about him. Robert Stranth. Thank you, shit. Yes. Exactly him. He's got a lot of uh, details of him of doing this stuff. <sighs> yes, this is a problem. I'm already trying to think of what parts of the loop macro could we do. This is the same cycle I go through every time. Fuck it. Not now. So, right. Um, let's... Let's switch back from the ugly one to the nice one again. He done that's interesting why aren't those moving Ooh. <laughs> don't break things now it was working you idiot we're taking we're rendering into the light FBO doing this it's fine. And then... Wait a second, where is the thing that uploads the light sampler? Ugh, that's weird. How has this been working? I don't understand why. <laughs> I just suddenly don't understand what's going on. What the fuck? Okay. Color me confused. This was working. How has this been? <laughs> How has this been working, you fuckers? Oh, that's upsetting. I'm just going to return it to how it was and just never mention this again. Feels like some dirty program state going on there. Let's not speak about what just happened. Okay, so. We don't need these guys anymore. But all the rest of it we can keep. Oh yeah, we don't need this. Ba -ba 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 -ba. And... That will probably do. Now, we need anti aliasing this thing as well. Oh, see, it still looks like garbage when it's moving. No. But the problem is, when it comes to anti aliasing, there's like, there's FXXA, or F FXAA, which is the one that some dude from NVIDIA just wrote out, like, the whole implementation in GLSL, and you can just download it. It's fucking awesome. You just get this whole shader, you strip out the parts that are console-specific, turn up all the values and just throw it in your game, and you have anti-aliasing. So I'm not sure that's the most exciting thing to do on a stream. I probably will throw it... Um, I need... Basically, I need to get it into Nineveh. And I might... I, I'm kind of torn on whether to just include it as is, just like in GLSL form, um, or I might, yeah, or I might like cross compile it over to um, over to Lisp because it would be kind of nice to have it 
implemented in Lisp, but same like everything else. We'll see. Pixel Law says, uh, for some reason, a lot of Lisp talks are horrible for recording quality. Yeah, that really, that really bites. It was kind of disappointing, actually, because we had one year, uh, like 2016. Um, it was a Lisper that was organizing the event, and it was really good. Um, this year, we were kind of cohabiting with the programming conference, which meant a lot of stuff was taken care. So the organ like the normal organizing folks didn't have to do it, which was a lovely relief for them. Um, but the quality of stuff like recording went downhill in a big way. So this year's recordings are, are disappointing, to be honest. There's some really good information in there, but it was just, it's just hard to listen to. And so I'm hoping through, and I, I know it in my, like the talk I gave downtown was the first time I was using the Mevo recording devices and I managed to fuck up the audio there. And the reason simply was I had left I had the camera capturing audio and I had the, the phone that is like the remote, that basically controls the camera over Wi-Fi. And I, it's, you can also have it capture audio from the phone. I'd left that on and it was on like 200% microphone volume. So it was just clipping out all the time. Every time I raise my voice, which is like all the time, I'm a loud talker. Yeah, the, the um, FXAA stuff is uh, pure post effect, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, if you if you run it on text, you'll fuck it up. But then you can just, you know, render the text separately and lay it on top. Um, oh, sorry. Like every everything I've just said, Shimera has already been telling uh, Pixelado. Hell, hey, on the stream. At least you got the version of it. Um, yeah, collocation. So yeah, basically, I'm... Oh, actually, we're at 21.42, so we're running up to the 10 o'clock mark anyway, which is when I normally stop. So basically, I'm kicking this over to you guys. I'm done. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and in the minutes to remain, we can either talk about some capital stuff, fuck around, like, general lispy shit, just natter, and... Um, or I'll end a little early. But it's up to you folks. Because I'm good for just caffeinating myself now and chilling. Sergeant Queef is saying, got an interesting problem right now I'm scratching my head with. Frames taking a lot longer than they should do. Um, okay, so is this with Keppel? Or is this with just SDL in general? I'm just so glad this is working. Apart from the little things we chose not to fix, it is working. So this is with SDL. Okay. Um, so are you doing GL rendering in SDL or are you using their services API, like non-accelerated services? Because if it's GL, I might know something, but if it's the services stuff, I don't know. Pomodoro an entire stream without pointing to your screen to show us something. I'm improving a lot. Hey, <laughs> progress. <laughs> yeah, imagine if one day I'm actually like slick at doing hosting stuff. That would that would be worrying. I don't think I'd want to see it anymore. <laughs> Darius, thanks for the session. Thank you, sir. Thanks for coming. Barrett, cool stuff. Thank you, sir. I'm using render draw point from CL SDL2. Render draw point. Ooh, what's that? Oh, draws a single point. Okay, yeah, if you're drawing one point at a time. Odds are things are going to be slow, and this doesn't sound like this is going to be using the, okay, SDL renderer. Maybe it can be drawing. See, so this is the problem. I'm just very low on knowledge of SDL. I use SDL for bootstrapping, for creating the GL context, and doing just, SDL is fucking great at getting you set up. 
getting your controllers and all that kind of stuff sorted, but I haven't been interested much in its API. Why isn't this a link? Why? What? Ah! So yeah, sorry, mate, but it, it does sound like you're drawing, <laughs> you're drawing lots of single points. That's not going to scale too well. Um, yeah. I can help you if you, yeah. Help with some GL stuff, maybe. I'm just generating one dimensional Perlian noise. Yeah, like that's, um, that's probably enough. But you can do with shaders. Got some functions for you right here in the Nineveh. Nineveh, ah. Pixel out is heading off. See you, dude. Thanks for coming. One forty-five p.m. Freedom time. Go make your haircut great again. Yeah, I mean, even that's the thing. If it's a re like, if it's a relatively recent laptop, you're probably running like um, one of the newer Intel kind of graphics cards and they're not too bad like it's actually getting tempted to tempting to buy a small laptop with a integrated gpu because it can handle a fair bit these days i mean, like i've got integrated gpu on the on the machine i actually do the streaming from running obs on but most of the time i'm like i've got an old where is it old uh, m11x like they don't make laptops decently small sizes anymore that have dedicated GPUs. So this is the last. I'm just gonna keep I'm gonna keep gluing this back together until it catches fire and dies. Because it's just so good. See ya Shin. Nice to have you, man. And I think we'll wrap up too, unless anyone's got any more for any more. See while well, I've got a second and throw it. Come on. Buffers read on me. What are you talking about? Something funky going on here. Anyway. just so nice when you get a technique that just composes really well like you throw something else at it and it works oh yeah that's the other thing what's the uh light position set up light cost to be the same as the position of camera one now it'll actually look like yeah that's where the light's coming from Oh, and Shadow's casting down properly. Oh, this is a success. I can live with this. Proper job. Push! Push! Good man. Yes. Oh, there, there wasn't anything else. It's just the sphere. Oh, I'll push it anyway. Go on. But that's all good to go. All right. You can, um, Sergeant Creep, if you want to come down to the uh, Lisp Games uh, room in IRC, we can chat more about this there as well. Uh, because there's more folks there who actually work with SDL directly as well. So they'll have a lot better idea than I will. But And that goes to actually everyone who's on watching this on YouTube as well. The uh, Lisp Games IRC is one of the kind of more active uh, Lisp IRCs. It's great fun. It's nice to hang out and watch. There's just a bunch of us. Very few who are actually making games. Most of us are procrastinating making libraries, but uh, still, it's good shit. Right, I am going to call the night. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone in the chat, for coming down. That was really awesome, and I will see you next time. Ciao.